So child sacrifice oh. in the Bible. So uh, every time we get close to like Easter or something like that, people start bringing up all the um, examples of child sacrifice in the Bible. And of course, you know, Easter is kind of about this gruesome human sacrifice thing anyway, where, you know, God supposedly sacrifices his own son for all the rest of us, even though we didn't ask for that. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I hear people talking about um, Abraham and Isaac and making the claim that uh, the fact that the angel stayed Abraham's hand at the last minute when he was going to kill Isaac means that this was a statement against child sacrifice in the Bible. Preposterous. Yeah. It reminds me, actually, um, when Paul in Philemon uh, basically writes, the, the entire letter to, to Philemon is that a slave has wronged Philemon and escaped and come to Paul and they've become friends. And Paul decides to send the slave back along with this letter basically saying, you know, hey, whatever he owes you, just put it on my account and uh, I'd, I'd really like it if you'd just let him go free. Well, that is not a, a statement against slavery in general. Right. That's somebody trying to lobby on behalf of their friend. And yet the Bible is so pro-slavery that whenever I have a discussion with somebody about you know, what, what exists in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy with regard to slavery, uh, eventually they'll say, yes, but the New Testament changes all that. Really? Yeah. How, how does it? Oh, because Paul asked for his slave friend to be let go. <laughs> oh, 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 that's that's such a wonderful declaration of the inhumanity of owning people as property. Hey, would you let my buddy go? I'm going to send him back to you because I think sending the slave back is the right thing to do and then ask you to release him because yeah. now, like us, he's a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, advocating for your friend like that is not a broad statement about the inhumanity of, of owning another human. It's just being a minimally decent person towards somebody that's your friend. Yeah, it's, and the, you, you had more on the, the binding of Isaac and whether or not this is a, an, a, a statement against child sacrifice. Because it seems to me, if I was a god and I was going to write the Ten Commandments, I, it would be very easy for me to write, thou shalt not own another human being as property, and thou shalt one. not sacrifice your children. I mean, right. isn't that the only state? If, you, if a god can say, you know, don't wear mixed fabrics and don't eat mm -hmm. shellfish, certainly he can say, don't kill your kids and don't own people. Yeah. Yeah, if he can tell you to cut part of your penis off, he can probably tell you to not kill your kid, you know? I, I don't know. I, but, I mean, one of the other arguments that this is not a broad statement about human sacrifice or child sacrifice in particular um, actually gets to um, another holiday that's being ce celebrated this week, which is Passover. Oh, God. Let's, and, let's kill all the kids. Yeah. Oh, the firstborn. The, first just born. the firstborn. Yeah. Yes, because the like tenth, me. the tenth and worst. Yeah, like me, the tenth and worst plague uh, that befell uh, the Egyptian firstborn you know, was that they would die. You know, and so you had to slaughter a lamb and spread its blood on your doorpost, and then the the angel of death or whatever would know to pass by this house and not kill your firstborn. And so uh, I don't know. It's like well, it's, it, it, so the Passover celebration is, you know, the, the Jewish tradition of celebrating the fact that God didn't kill our firstborn. Right. But let's be honest, you, you are also not in any way seem to be bothered by the fact that he killed the firstborn of the Egyptians. Right. Not the least of which, this struck me as odd, what kind of weird magic is this that the first fully formed child to exit a particular womb has some... <laughs> Some status, you know. Yeah. How many? How many? You know, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe you're not the firstborn. If in fact there were a number of miscarriages before, uh, mm -hmm. we're living in a time where you know children died all the time, where there were complications with pregnancy or anything. What is this weird blood magic ritual that the first, the first kid out of your your clown car uterus for the uh, uh, the quiverful people who are yeah. pumping out kids at an incredible rate? Uh, that they're somehow special and so special that the trick is to kill something else and put its blood all around yeah. so that God can't or won't uh, come and take your... F I, I don't get it. Well, and it, it kind of gets back to this idea that um, within these sort of um, religions with these morally concerned gods, that you have to sacrifice something to the god. And... The more important that something is, the greater the significance of the sacrifice. 
And for a lot of people, their firstborn child is, you know, like the most important thing ever. Um, certainly for, for most parents. Because um, it's the one that's going to take care of all the kids that come after it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, for parents, it's like, you know, yeah, this, your, your firstborn child is a hugely emotional event. It's got great significance, and it doesn't mean you love your, you know, subsequent children any less. But you know, this is the thing that kind of starts you on your path to being a parent. As a message to my mm -hmm. younger brother, yes, it does mean that your yeah. parents love you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so it does. I understand that there's a, a significance to us. My my comment about this being some kind of magical thing. Uh, firstborn children, first of all, they tended to be the older ones. They were the mm -hmm. ones that could work, that could help out with the other things. Right. So uh, it would seem to me that if you had an enemy be it a god or whatever, who you knew was going to kill your firstborn children. Um, you just like kill the first kid right off the bat so you get that mm -hmm. done with, and now your second one becomes the important one and you move on. Yeah. I mean, you kind of been, couldn't have which, been that attached to them. They're a couple days old. Which there's um, some, I guess, some evidence that that sort of child sacrifice was practiced quite a bit mm -hmm. in the ancient Near East. You know, the weird thing for me on child, you know, there, there's the passage uh, about, um, you know, let's kill and eat your kid and blah, blah, blah. But there's also Jephthah and his daughter where right. he makes yeah. the deal with God that if you let me win this war, I'll sacrifice the, or this battle, I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house when I get home. What the mm -hmm. heck else could it be other than his only daughter? Right. Uh, now, there are people who say he didn't actually kill her. Yeah. Well, I... Uh, my reading of it is that he did what he said he would do. Yeah. That's what the Bible says, so I, I suspect he killed her. But the people who try to make excuses will say that Jephthah turned her over to service in the church. Well, whoop de frickin' do Yeah. What, where, where was her say in any of this? When did, when did she agree to become a, a slave or sex concubine to the temple? Hmm? Why, why isn't she considered in this deal? And the same thing applies to Abraham and Isaac. We talk about, you know, I grew up hearing how wonderful it was that Abraham was so fearful and devoted to mm -hmm. God that he was willing to do anything God said, including giving up his son who he absolutely loved. Well, there's really not much in there about um, Isaac and how traumatizing it must be to have your dad pack you off, tie you up, and get ready to stab you with a knife only for, you know, him to supposedly supposedly stop um I, I don't necessarily buy into the idea that yeah. that he killed him and then we covered it up through revisions it's not impossible it's not like we have yeah. the originals uh but this whole thing about a test yeah when i was a kid uh i was like why would god need to test anybody shouldn't god know yeah and the answer the apologetic was this test wasn't for god's benefit it was for abraham's benefit so that mm -hmm. abraham would understand how devoted he was and should be to God and what benefits would come from it. Okay, fine. But if you read through there, the angel appears and, and the angel says, I now know that you fear God, which mm -hmm. makes it at best a test for that angel and yeah. not for God or Abraham. Well, and now I'm starting to be a little concerned about Abraham's moral standards because, I mean, you know, if, if he wasn't like himself traumatized by what he was willing to do. <laughs> well, it seems to me that the only, if God is opposed to child sacrifice, if Yahweh really is opposed to child sacrifice, mm -hmm. then when Yahweh tells you to kill your kid, the only correct response is, depart from me, foul spirit, I don't know who you are, you cannot possibly be my God because my God is opposed to child sacrifice. Yeah. But that's not what Abraham did. Right. Abraham went with his understanding of God, which was that, yes, in fact, God can and would potentially ask you to kill your kid. And he was rewarded for that. Now, if I was the kind of God who was opposed to child sacrifice, and I said, sacrifice your kid, and my devout followers started to do it, I'd be, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. You should know. You should know me well enough to know that I'm opposed to that, and I would never ask that of you. Yeah. So it's a, it's a failed test all the way around. Meanwhile, we get to Easter. Yeah. Where where God sacrifices his only begotten son. Right. For a weekend. Yeah. Um, to act as a loophole around rules that he's evidently responsible for. Um, what, none of this substitutionary atonement makes any sense. If Jen owes you money and I pay 
what she owes you. I have relinquished her debt, but if she punches you in the face and I say I'm sorry, yeah, <laughs> I haven't done anything. Yeah, you know. So when we're talking about this well, notion of you know, you guys are so sinful that you made me kill my own son. No, you are. You, you did that. Yeah. You know. Well, and this idea of substitutionary atonement was so abhorrent to the founders of this country that we wrote it into the Constitution that you can't do that. There's no blood guilt, you know. Yeah. You can't um, you can't go to prison in place of, you know, someone else. Um, you basically you can't be made to pay a penalty for a crime that someone else committed. Yeah, and that when, when you dig through the Bible, you're punished to the fourth generation or the tenth right. generation, depending on which verses you're. Yeah. Reading. You kill somebody, your kids are going to pay. So today is the day um, that uh, Christians celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. Yeah. With absolutely no evidence to support the idea. Um, and I've debated the resurrection on a couple of different occasions. Uh, one of my interesting, one of the things that I find most interesting is to ask people to try to reconcile the different accounts in the Gospels. Now, in the last debate that I did on the resurrection, I debated Mike Lacona, and he never touched or mentioned the Gospels at all. He thinks that what Paul had to say is the best uh, evidence we have for the resurrection. Well, but Paul never said he even met Jesus. You know, I raised that point, and, and I'll be talking about this in the debate review, and Mike's point was, how do you know? I think it's entirely possible that Paul might have met Jesus. And I'm like, wow. Uh, Has he actually read? Nowhere this? is there any, any remote hint that that ever occurred. And don't you think that if Paul actually met Jesus, even if he was you know, a mocker at one point, he would say, I met this man when he was preaching in Galilee, and I mocked him. And now I've changed my mind. Of course that's going to be mentioned. So it's, it's preposterous. But when you look at the biblical accounts, one of the things that's, problem, that's a problem with the Bible is that you have the four Gospels, mm -hmm. and they appear in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John order. Now, that's not the order in which they were written. Right. If instead you put them in the order that they were written, beginning with Mark, and then continuing on with Luke and Matthew, and then ending with John, which is, as far as I know by all scholars, the most probable order. Yeah. Um, what you see is a story where Paul basically just says, prior to the Gospels, because Paul was writing before this, he, he says Christ rose and appeared to people, including 500 people who we don't have any information about, we don't have any names, we don't have any way of looking into this, but he says some of them are still alive, maybe you can go and find them type mm -hmm. things. Um, and that's it. Paul's account doesn't mention an empty tomb or, or the discovery of this or any of the other details. Then you get to Mark. Uh, and Mark's account, which was written five to 30 years later. I mean, it's really hard to date these things. We don't know who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Those are just names that right. were plopped on by the church, which tend to give people in the pews the idea that, oh, these were written by eyewitnesses and people who were close to the events when there's no evidence that that's actually the case. Um, if you go back to the debate that I did uh, against Blake Junta, which you can find on YouTube, so I'm not gonna repeat it. I go through each of the gospels and where there's conflicts, you know? When did Jesus die? Did zombies rise up and march on Jerusalem? Who, who got to the temple first? Uh, what did they see? Did they see an angel? Did they see, was the rock already rolled away or not? Were there multiple angels? You know, what was the instruction? Who did they go and tell? Uh, because, you know, in Mark, uh, the stone has already moved out of the way. There was a, a young man inside wearing white. And uh, the women were afraid and didn't tell anyone. And that's where Mark ends at, uh, I think it's verse 15. Mark chapter 9, I think it's verse 15. And then, or maybe it's verse 8. And then 9 through 20, or 16 through 20. I think it's 9 through 20. This is what's been added on to Mark afterwards. Uh, somebody adds, yeah, verses 9 through 20 on. And what they added was uh, that their, verse 8 ended with no sign of Jesus and the women not telling anybody. So let's completely reverse that in verses nine and 10, where Mary then runs off to go tell the disciples. Yeah. That, that is so strange that you can ignore everything else that the Bible has to say about the resurrection and just look at the, verse, the, the ver verses in the book of Mark, which was written first, and say, hey, it comes along and they were afraid and they told no one. And then the next two verses completely reverse that. 
I don't even know how that makes it, you know, into the modern era without being obvious. And if you open up uh, an NIV version of the Bible or anything along those uh, lines where there's where there's honest scholarship regarding these things, what you'll find is a note. Yeah. That basically says the oldest and best manuscripts of the Book of Mark end at verse eight, and verses nine through twenty. Uh, which also is where you get the snake handling stuff, how they mm -hmm. can drink poison and it's not going to hurt them. Yeah. These were all added later. If that's the case, why are we still printing Bibles and handing them out to people in churches with these bizarre verses that reverse the position and then go on to say, now you must go tell everybody and you will know my people because they'll be able to handle snakes and drink poison and nothing can harm them and they'll, you know. That's so strange. Yeah. That, you know, somebody asked me the other day, uh, they were trying to read the Bible, and they they kept getting stuck. It was just boring. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I get it. The bagats are definitely boring. Uh, <laughs> but there's other stuff. And they wanted a recommendation. And my first thought is, why do you care? Why is it that you're actually trying to right. read this? Is it because you worry that some theist is going to come up to you and say, have you read the Bible? And you want to be able to say yes. Because I can tell you that in most situations, that changes nothing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's the opening line, but it whatever your answer is, have you read the it, it Bible? It doesn't matter. Yes. Okay. How do you prove that? See, this is something where people have spent their entire lives studying it and trying to find new ways to interpret it and all this other stuff. Just saying you've read it, it doesn't tell us anything. And 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 by the way, even if you convince them that you read it, what they're going to say is, well, you didn't understand it or you didn't read it yep. with an open heart. So they're going to come up with excuse yep. after excuse about how you could possibly read this and not accept it. So if that's the only reason, I wouldn't bother. Um, and you don't have to read it to study different aspects of it, like even just what I was pointing out with the Book of Mark. It's, if instead you're wanting to read it for understanding, if you're wanting to read it so that you can specifically you know, counter it, prepare for a lot of work. This is, this is you know, you're going to have to talk to a bunch of different apologists who are going to have their own interpretations and spin and be able to address why and how you don't agree with those things. Yeah, and in the meantime, there's there's a lot of um, scholars who've done, um, I guess, a more in-depth analysis of specific parts of the Bible. Um, there's one that I always recommend, um, and I'll have to think about it, but it was written by two Jewish scholars. That Is, Israel Finkelstein? Yeah. And I've forgotten the other ones. Yeah, name. I can't remember the... Neil... Um, something or other. Anyway, um, this one actually, it, it, the, these two guys are Jewish scholars, and they basically are saying, you know, that whole Exodus thing that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and so th that's kind of, you know, central to their religious tradition. Um, and they're the ones saying, hey, this did not happen. There's no evidence. So, you know, it, the fact that it's Jewish scholars saying this tells me I probably should take that pretty seriously because they're kind of acting against their cultural interests, you know. The thing is, if they're wrong, how do we demonstrate that they're wrong? How, yeah. how do we go about finding out whether or not something thousands of years in the past actually happened in the way that we, the reports that we have now say it happened? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not Doctor Who. I don't have a TARDIS or a time machine. Uh, all we can do is look at the reports and try to determine how reasonable the reports are. And as soon as you start looking at reports of miracle accounts of, mm -hmm. you know, that we have no reason to think that they're real, um, I think you've got to chuck it out. Yeah. And, and I, that was chuck it out as in throw it out, not check it out. But I'm right. happy to, to have somebody try and investigate as best they can, which is how you end up with people like Ron Wyatt, oh, who yeah. seems to think he finds Noah's Ark and, and ancient Egyptian chariot wheels uh, every other week or so. Yeah. Or, or did, and now it's just every other week he announces again the thing that he thinks yeah, the he thing, found 20 it, Yeah, years and ago. somebody keeps sending, uh, periodically we'll get an email from somebody saying, hey, how do you guys refute this? <laughs> yeah. It's like, this guy is like the Indiana Jones of the Seventh-day Adventists, except he has no background in archaeology or history or anything, anything remotely credible that would allow him to go in and you know, make these claims. It reminds me of all the people who used to sell, like, the, the this is a splinter from the actual yeah. cross. <laughs> yeah. You know, how do I know that? Well, I'm telling you, it's the case. Yeah. yeah. And it's carbon dated to be that old. Yeah. Oh, what about the two guys who were crucified on the other side of them? How do I know that splinter didn't come from one of them? Yeah. I, I only want it if it came from, you know, the stick Jesus was hanging on. <laughs>